This is a special meeting at the 1982 National Farmers Organization Convention in Louisville, Kentucky. Featured guest is Kalo Heinemann of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. At that time, I asked him if he would spend some time with us at our national convention, and he agreed to do it. As a result of that, I went to Frank, and I explained to Frank that we'd had the conversation, and Frank and I felt that agricultural producers, specifically grain and livestock producers, jointly should have this meeting today to get a better insight of some of those options available to you as producers that were discussed briefly yesterday afternoon in the General Assembly. So on behalf of the livestock and grain departments, I want to welcome you to this session dealing with forward contracting. The gentleman that will be principally conducting this meeting is Kalo Heinemann from Washington, D.C. Kalo corrected me three or four times today by making that statement. He wanted me to say that he's a cattle feeder and rancher from Dighton, Kansas, because that's mostly the truth. I've known Kalo Heinemann since the latter 60s. I was in the packing company at Garden City, Kansas as head buyer and bought Kalo's cattle off his feedlot up at Dighton. But years go by and names go by and acquaintances go by. And when I had my conversation with Kalo, he had to remind me that that wasn't the first we'd had. So I do know him as a good operator. I know him as a, an extremely astute businessman in relation to agribusiness. I know him as a man that can protect himself and the people that he's responsible for in the face of most kind of financial adversities. I know that President Reagan recognized that in Kalo Heinemann and in December of 81 President Reagan appointed Kalo Heinemann to the job of commissioner for the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, which is the watchdog that oversees new policies, that oversees new programs, and generally polices the activities of the Board of Trade and the Chicago Mercantile and Kalo's job as that commissioner makes him one of five commissioners. He happens to be the only agricultural producer on that commission. He commented as I brought him in from the airport today, that's the kind of odds I like because that's the kind of odds farmers have had for years. I know him to be an extremely tough and astute person. I want you as my fellow members and constituents here to understand that Kalo today cannot endorse the National Farmers Organization per se because of the capacity he serves. I want you to understand that he can't endorse any specific commodity group in the nation. But I want you to know that he is extremely highly respected by all of us that are in this business, that know this business, and know how it must be run. I want to take one moment and explain Frank and I, our reasoning for asking Kalo here. 
since I've been in your organization, and as Devon repeatedly informs me, it's mine now too, so say it. I've seen and I have sensed a certain paranoia, it's the best word I have, about futures trading. I've never had that fear as a producer. I've had that fear had I been in a speculative aspect, probably living on Wall Street in New York City or something like that. But as a producer, it's a viable extended tool that I can use to enhance my own operation. It's a general lack of understanding that developed the paranoia that I hear among some ag producers. Now, forward contracting, per se, is not for everyone. Forward contracting on your own, and I'll use the term using a bucket shop in your local town, that commodity office, can be a disastrous venture that can break you for life. If you try it on your own and are not adept and astute at that type of transactions. But forward contracting, as it relates to the National Farmers Organization's programs, is a must. I feel, and as does Frank feel, you must understand this high risk, volatile, dangerous, area of marketing that is called futures trading is not our program. Our program is a totally protected, no risk venture for you as a producer, simply an option developed by us for your benefit. I feel you need to understand the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. I think you need to understand futures trading. And for those reasons, we've asked Kalo to come here as our guest and present this program. Without further introduction, Kalo Heinemann. Thank you, Walt. You know, in, in our other life, our other association, you know, he was that packer buyer I had to deal with. That's a different story. <laughs> I'd like to touch base just a little bit on some of the overviews of the futures market. I ran into some old friends here from Kansas a little bit ago. I'm glad to see there are a lot of them around here wearing that sunflower. <laughs> One of them was Paul Nauer, state president. Paul was in my office in Washington, D.C. along this spring sometime, and we had an awful good visit. And we were talking about how the, the futures markets, particularly in the grains, like in wheat, how our futures markets really are the world market. I had some people from the Australian Wheat Board in my office Along about that time, I don't remember whether it was just before or just after Paul and I had had that visit, but, but these people were there. The Australian Wheat Board, you know, owns all of the wheat in Australia. They take it from the farmers, pay them a certain price at the time they take it. They, they do all the selling, even internally, in their, in their own country. And, invest in, and, and they hedge some of their, their, foreign, their foreign sales, they hedge them in our futures markets to hedge that risk while they're putting the deal together. They're in the process now of trying to get enabling legislation in their own country to let them hedge a little bit more. He says, you know, you just well let us hedge there because the fact we're in the cash market and what happens there, we're in that market anyway. But Paul and I were talking about this, and Paul said to me, you know, I've thought about this a lot of times since then, and I've used it a lot of times. Paul said, you know, if we didn't have a futures market, we'd have to invent one. And I've thought about that a lot. In my prepared remarks, I'll try to cover three general areas. Some background on the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, which I will refer to as the CFTC. 
including our latest rule enforcement review of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, some current futures risk management and marketing issues, and agriculture commodity options. The CFTC, who are we and what do we do? I've been at the CFTC for almost a year now. My job is an interesting one and presents many challenges. I have found the Commission staff to be hardworking, dedicated, and able people. I've also seen the value of bringing viewpoints from different segments of the private sector into the decision-making process through the appointment of commissioners with varied backgrounds. I hope that this tradition continues and that in the future, with the support of groups like the NFO, there will continue to be an agriculture producer on the commission. It makes a difference. The CFTC is an independent agency, federal agency, charged with regulating all commodity futures trading in the United States. It is made up of a commissioner, or of a chairman and four other commissioners appointed by the president for five-year terms. We regulate 11 exchanges and over 85 actively traded futures contracts on everything from agriculture commodities, which now account for about half of all trading, to industrial products from metals to financial instruments to stock indices. I said commodity, the agriculture commodities amount to about half now, where it used to be all of it. You know, you could jump to the assumption that the trade in our commodities has been going down just from that statement. But in 1960, as compared to 1980, there's 15 times as many contracts traded, agricultural contracts, as there was in 1960. So it is increasing by leaps and bounds. <clears throat> the newest development within our jurisdiction is options. Effective October 1 of this year, we authorized the initiation of exchange-traded options in non-agricultural commodities on a limited pilot program basis. In essence, the CFTC's job is to establish and police a regulatory framework to assure that futures markets operate competitively and free of manipulation or fraud. In so doing, they will be better able to serve their intended economic purpose of, and I think this is important, the economic purposes of risk transfer and price discovery. I think a lot of times we make a, we make a mistake when we, t when we think of the futures market as an acquisition market. They don't work well when we try to make an acquisition market out of them. I don't have the time to describe all of the CFTC's functions, but I would like to touch on one of the most important but least visible things we do, and that is market surveillance. Our Division of Economics and Education includes a staff of 21 surveillance economists, each of whom is responsible for several specific commodities. Speaking about the economists, I read a little thing in Barron's the other day. Two of the other commissioners when I went on board were PhD economists, so I kind of had to sharpen up my, my array of, of weapons, you know, to, to kind of barb the economists a little and kind of keep them on the, on the even. But anyway, it seems that the Lord created the first economist, and the devil was nonplussed. <laughs> but the devil, in retaliation, created another economist. You know, I think if you took the words, on the other hand, away from economists, they probably couldn't talk. <laughs> Harry Truman said it best. He said, if I could just find a one-armed economist. But anyway, we have 21 economists on our surveillance staff, and I don't know whether they're right-handed right or left-handed economists. I suspect we have both. I hope we do. But these 21 surveillance economists review trading in these commodities on a daily basis, monitoring such factors as the size of open positions, the activities of large traders, both hedgers and speculators, key price relationships, availability of deliverable supplies, delivery capabilities, and other problems, particularly threats of market manipulation. The full commission meets in closed session each Friday morning to review expiring contracts and to discuss surveillance concerns raised by the staff. These sessions go into considerable detail, including discussions of the market positions and intentions of specific individual traders. 
Where potential problems exist, we have a variety of responses available, ranging from job owning to warning letters to direct intervention in the markets, such as ordering liquidation-only trading. The CFTC has had to use direct intervention only four times since it was formed in 1975. But that power is the shotgun behind the door that makes other less drastic measures generally effective. Another of the Commission's oversight duties is to review how well the exchanges enforce their own rules and to require improvements where necessary. Earlier this year, we completed an in-depth rule review, rule enforcement review of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, as well as a lot of the other exchanges. In the CMA review, they, we included a it included a detailed on-site inspection of all relevant files, computer runs, and other records, as well as interviews of exchange personnel. Minor deficiencies were found in an otherwise acceptable review. I found the CMA rule enforcement re review particularly interesting because it included a detailed study of exchange emergency actions on an agricultural futures contract, the November 1981 feeder cattle contract, which I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with. The Commission staff determined that the CMA emergency measures, including liquidation-only trading and reduced position limits, were not taken in bad faith and that there were no conflicts of interest on the CMA Business Conduct Committee. However, the CMA did share a problem common to all the exchanges. They all tend to treat each conflict question on a case-by-case -case basis without the benefit of written standards. Absent such standards, there is no way for producers to be assured that conflicts have, in fact, been avoided or that they will continue to be avoided in the future. As I recently told a gathering of commodity industry lawyers in Chicago, the key here is the public's perception. I am not so much con concerned with the fact of conflicts of interest because I believe that in practice exchange decision makers have generally behaved responsibly. You know, they have their own people are on both sides of that market all the time. Rather, I am concerned with the appearance of conflicts where ad hoc committee exchange procedures leave the door open for the appearance of conflicts, the charges that conflicts have occurred are almost inevitable. Such charges, by their nature, are very difficult to disprove, and the problem is multiplied by the absence of written standards. The Commission is currently reviewing exchange conflict of interest rules at the staff level. When this issue is brought before the Commissioners, I assure you it will receive my closest attention. Turning to more general futures risk management and marketing issues, I would like to look first at the questions that have traditionally surrounded the futures markets, at least in the minds of producers. What is it that we producers distrust and fear in the futures markets? Is our distrust based on the suspicion that these markets are not openly competitive? Do we question whether the CFTC and exchange surveillance staffs are functioning in a way that assures open competition? Is our distrust due to the fact that important segments of producers, processors, wholesalers, and retailers still do not use these markets? Are we suspicious because futures markets are anticipatory and thus sometimes run contrary to current cash market prices? By that, I mean they're trying to project prices in the future. Do we fear that the futures markets are contributing to volatility in the cash market? I certainly don't claim to have the answers to all of these questions. Part of my purpose here today is to get you thinking about those answers. I would, however, like to share a few general observations with you. First, regarding the reservoir of distrust and fear of futures markets among agriculture producers and their bankers, and no one can deny that these feelings exist, but I believe their main cause is simply a basic lack of communication and understanding. It is a natural human instinct to be suspicious of that which we do not understand, and the vast majority of we farmers and our bankers simply do not understand the futures markets or the relationships 
between those markets and the underlying cash markets. In many instances, the underlying cash markets have undergone significant changes and will continue to do so as older marketing patterns give way to new ones. The futures markets, being highly visible, often get blamed for these changes and dislocations, becoming the focal point of producers' frustrations. And you know, in our frustrations, and I've felt them, you can tell by the color of my hair, probably a lot more years than some of you. And those frustrations are real. But in our frustrations, let's not do like a friend of mine. He's also, I'm sure, a good acquaintance of Walt's feedlot manager, Dighton. And he's one of these hard-charging guys. And he goes to work early every morning. And he's in such a hurry, with about a block or two before he gets to the edge of the town, you know what happens. He kicks it. Well, the local police got a little tired of that, so they started stopping him, giving him tickets. About the third or fourth time they stopped him, he said, well, we're going to have to give you another ticket. He said, he said what would a season ticket cost? Sometimes we feel like that. That's probably not the best way to plead your case. <laughs> With respect to cash futures volatility, I think we have a chicken and egg question. And I think experience shows that cash market volatility comes first. As a general rule, there cannot and will not be a successful futures market contract unless there is already volatility in the cash market. The onion market provides a good example. A few years back, futures trading in onions was prohibited by statute. The ban was adopted at the urging of producers, due at least in part to their fears on the volatility issue. Congress passed a bill to do this. Yet subsequent studies have suggested that there was more volatility in cash onions, both before and after the period of futures trading, than there was during the time when the onion futures markets was in operation. Interest rates provide another good example of cash volatility, creating the demand for futures trading. Over the many years when interest rates were flat, there was no interest in financial futures. But when economic conditions changed and interest rates became volatile, an amazing array of interest rate and other financial futures sprang up almost like magic. The phenomenal success of these new financial instrument contracts is due in great part to large institutional customers using the futures markets to hedge their financial risks. Many large banks, including the Bank of America and Morgan Guarantee Trust, have even applied to have subsidiaries registered with the CFTC as futures brokers. But today, no one sector of our economy has an exclusive on risk. And I'm sure an audience of livestock and grain producers understands this only too well. I suspect a number of you could personally attest that what sufficed as adequate risk management in times of lesser volatility is often no longer adequate today. Therefore, it should not be surprising that an array of new risk management techniques is becoming available. The problem for today's farmer, as for any other businessman, is to discover and adopt those procedures, whether new or old, which are best suited for one's own operation. This is by no means an easy task. We farmers have historically preferred to deal with the concrete formulas of production agriculture. We have preferred handling tangible matters, bushels per acre, rates of gain per pound of feed, and have been uncomfortable with the abstract principles involved in marketing and risk management. But like it or not, it is in those areas where we need to do a better job in our fight for survival. Please note that in this context, I am not talking just about futures trading. Futures are only just one of a number of available marketing and risk management tools. And to survive today, a farmer needs to be familiar with all of them. In many instances, a combination of risk management techniques can provide the best results. We're in a fight where we need to be able to use two hands or three or four hands if we got them. One very valuable technique that I know has been discussed at this convention at length 
and will be discussed more, is, of course, forward contracting. In my own farming operation, which my son is now running, forward contracting with feedlot operators for many years provided me with a useful method of marketing feeder cattle and thereby a useful risk management technique. In recent times, I have also forward contracted sales of grain with the local co-op. These grain forward contracts have, in fact, been an indirect use of the futures market since the co-op has, in turn, used futures to hit its commitments to producers. One observation I have made about forward contracting is that the level of producer acceptance increases in relation to how closely the forward contract delivery procedures follow local cash market delivery procedures. Price averaging is a somewhat simpler and less flexible marketing tool but can be quite useful, particularly for producers who buy and sell frequently. Another set of very widely used marketing and risk management tools have been the various government farm programs. Many farmers probably do not think of these programs in the same context as the other items I have mentioned, but they certainly can play a major role in farmers' marketing and risk management strategy. Of course, Proper risk management should not be limited solely to the output of the farmer's operation. Inputs such as seed, feed, and fertilizer, feed, seed, and fertilizer, and particularly interest rates on the borrowings, should also be factored in. To sum up, there are no easy answers in the cash forward or futures markets. The key is to learn all you can about all the various tools and techniques available, and then to use that knowledge to tailor a marketing and risk manage manage management plan for your own individual needs. If anyone still doubts the need for producer marketing expertise, let me just refer you to a couple of statistics. A recent issue of the Livestock Weekly out of San Angelo, Texas, reports on a survey done by Bill Hellman of Livestock Business Advisory Services. Bill looked at the last 15 years of production, sales, and price data and found that farmers and ranchers market at least 60% of all livestock and free stocks of grain each year during the lower one-third of the annual price range. 60% in the lower one-third of the annual price range. At the same time, no more than 10% of farmers and ranchers market their products in the upper one-third of the price range. In the face of this kind of need, it is reassuring to me to see the high priority currently being given to marketing and marketing education by the NFO and other major farm organizations. But there is one additional step that I would urge the NFO to take, and that is to organize a futures committee. A number of other ag organizations have recently formed such committees and have found them to be very useful. The obvious benefit of such a committee, educating the members about futures market issues, may not be the most significant one. I don't need to remind anyone here that we live in a changing world. Futures markets are certainly no exception, as illustrated by the development of new contracts in financial instruments and stock indices. But the more traditional agricultural contracts are constantly changing as well and will undoubtedly continue to do so. As these changes go forward, active ag organization futures committees can help provide needed practical input for regulatory bodies such as the CFTC. They can also be invaluable in communicating producer concerns directly and effectively to the exchanges themselves. I welcome these groups. They're a big help to me. The cattle contract certificate of delivery system currently proposed by the Chicago Mercantile Exchange is a good example of the need for and the value of such communication. Producer input was a key element in formulating that proposal from start to finish. We expect that rule change package to authorize this new system will be presented to the full commission for final consideration within the next couple of weeks, and I anticipate that it will be approved. Having mentioned delivery, I would like to touch on one other delivery-related issue, one that goes even one step further than certificate delivery, and that is cash settlement. 
cash settlement of futures contracts completely avoids delivery of physicals and the problems that go with it. Cash settlement focuses attention on transferring risk rather than tra transferring a physical product. The Commission has already approved cash settlement for futures contracts on euro dollars and stock indices. So we do have something to look at. A few weeks ago, I spent an entire day with producers interested in the first exchange proposal to institute cash settlement in a futures contract on a perishable agricultural commodity. That contract being potato futures on the New York Mercantile Exchange. Of course, cash settlement is not a panacea. It would bring its own problems, primarily the need for a reliable cash price series or index agreeable to that particular industry that could be used as to set the settlement price. Formulating such an index could be a very tough problem. I know that. But with the, the reservoir of expertise and ingenuity that we have in American agriculture, I do not automatically see this as an insurmountable pr problem. In any case, the approach that I'm taking for now is simply to try to get people thinking about this issue, both in public appearances such as this and in commission meetings. As we consider cash settlement for other contracts, I will continue to urge that we all look at the livestock contracts and at other appropriate agricultural future contracts and ask, what if? Agriculture commodity options. Yesterday, I spent the afternoon over at the Capitol building listening to the conference committee consider the reauthorization bill for the CFTC. In that bill, this is the conference committee of the Senate and House considering all of the proposals, and there's many things in that bill, but one thing in there is a proposal to lift the ban on agricultural options. That proposal passed both the Senate and the House in the agriculture committees and on the floor, very little dissent, if any. So I suspect that, that it, you know, barring our bill getting vetoed or not passed for other reasons, I suspect that the lifting of the ban on ag options is in the very near future. <clears throat> My final topic involves this new type of contract, which is not yet available, but may someday become another of your risk management tools, ag commodity options. An option is a unilateral contract which gives the purchaser the right to buy, in the case of a call option, or sell, in the case of a put option, a specified quantity of a commodity, and here let me say that probably at the beginning at least would be a, an options contract on that commodity, but would sell it at a specific price within a specific specified period of time regardless of the market price of that underlying commodity. The premium is the variable market determined price the option purchaser pays for this right. Now what did I say? Let's make it easy. It's easier to understand options once you realize that many of you already are probably using a type of option. Government price support loans are, in effect, a put option for the farmer. The main difference is that they are free, if anything from other Uncle Sam is really free, since Uncle Sam doesn't charge a premium. One of the main benefits of options is that they are one-sided. A put option, for example, like the government price support program, can insulate a producer from price declines without cutting him off from upside profit potential if prices increase. A call option can perform a similar function in the opposite direction for a commercial hedger or a commercial user of grain such as a flour miller or a feedlot operator. In this sense, an option functions like an insurance policy. A little on the history of the ag options. Options on agricultural commodities were the first options traded in this country. They had, to put it mildly, a checkered history, including charges of both fraudulent sales practices and market manipulation. As early as 1874, the Illinois State Legislature banned options trading, both on and off exchanges, but the law was never enforced. Thereafter, options trading was alternately prohibited and allowed 
under various legislative initiatives and exchange rule provisions. Finally, as a part of the Commodity, Commodity Exchange Act of 1936, option trading in the agricultural commodities named in that act was made subject to an absolute federal prohibition. That ban is still in effect today. And I just told you the fate of that rests at this time in that conference committee. I believe, <clears throat> but I do expect that this land will be, that this ban will be lifted. I believe this provision is entirely justified because there have been a great number of changes since the 1936 ban. For one thing, there is now a fra regulatory framework in place for options. There was not then. When Congress created the CFTC in 1974, it gave the Commission the power to prohibit or allow options trading in the non-enumerated commodities which first became regulated under the CFTC Act. Those commodities included metals, financial instruments, and the world agricultural commodities, coffee, sugar, and cocoa. On August 31st of this year, after very lengthy and thorough deliberations, the Commission designated option contracts in certain of these commodities. Trading in the first of these options began in October of this year as part of a limited three-year pilot program. In agriculture, if agricultural options are allowed, therefore, it will be in the context of an already established regulatory framework. The abuses which led to the 1936 ban were possible because options trading was going on in a virtually unregulated environment. Today, however, an exchange must establish a comprehensive ongoing self-regulatory program as a precondition for designation to trade options. The exchange program is in turn subject to strict oversight by the Commission and the newly formed National Futures Association will also play a significant self-regulatory role. Another difference is in the options themselves. Agricultural options under the pilot program would be a very different instrument than those which prompted the 1936 ban. <clears throat> the 1930s options were dailies or weeklies, sold at the end of a trading day and expiring at the close of the next day's or the next week's trading. The short-term nature of these instruments gave them little commercial utility and often led to congestion at the close of futures trading when option exercises were added to the liquidation of day traders' positions. Pilot program agricultural options by contracts, contrast would have a duration of a given number of months consistent with the underlying futures contract and would expire well in advance of the close of futures trading in order to avoid potential congestion problems. Finally, even under the most optimistic of timetables, it would be at least the fall of 1983 before the designation process for agricultural options could be completed, and I doubt if it happens quite that fast. Thus, when and if those options did begin trading, they would benefit from a full year's experience of options trading in other commodities under the pilot program. By then, it is hoped the bugs would be worked out of the system and agricultural options would be able to get off to a smooth start. In view of these significant changes since the original options ban, I think we should give agricultural options another chance and give farmers another potential risk management tool. Let's don't throw tools away. Let's gather up as many as we can and learn how to use them. In addition to the obvious applicability for grain farmers others and others, such as feedlot operators, for example, might also have potential uses for options. By adding a further element of predictability to a feeding program without sacrificing needed flexibility, call options on feed grains might prove to be a very useful management tool for livestock feeders. The utility of such options will, of course, depend on how high the premium costs are. And that is something that only the market can tell us. But I do feel the time is right to lift the 1936 ban and let the market give us that answer. Thank you for your kind attention. Ladies and gentlemen, there was a definite purpose for Kalo's talk today. I know in sitting here listening that much of what he covered, I didn't understand.
But that's the purpose of having Kalo here, is for this reason. What he has discussed here is what has made, for instance, the cattle industry, the feeding industry, grow as it has grown in the Southwest, for instance, in the feedlot country, for instance. It is that ability to take advantage of every option available. Now, we don't have to understand everything that Kalo was discussing here today because we know that a man that represents us understands it in himself and he will make sure that no one can lead us down the path with those options and those future tradings and those risks and those manipulations that he was referring to. It's, on the other hand, up to myself as your employee, up to Frank as your employee, to make sure that we take the best of what he's able to generate and put it into a risk-free, viable program for yourselves as producers. I don't know how many of you were in the hog meetings today, just roughly, give me an indication, quite a few. I'm glad to see that. Did any of you feel the same? I wrote it down. Uh, Kayla was commenting about they had run a study on onions in relation to futures and cash market of which was the most volatile. You know, that reminded me of that graph Larry Sills showed you today in the hog meeting in relation to 1981 and 1982 Iowa interior cash market in relation to forward contracts. Do you recall seeing that graph? Do you recall seeing that extreme validity, uh, volatility in the cash market and that sort of but a, more of a steadying influence through the futures contracting? If you saw that, that is I believe a, an, excellent, an excellent example of as it would pertain to livestock. It does steady and stabilize. It will. Now granted, as again, I'm going to use Larry's presentation today. Granted, there were some times in 1982 you would have been net dollars return ahead had you not Ford contracted. Maybe. Maybe. But what you really knew was when you locked that animal in, the hog, for 50 cents a pound, when you could, in fact, at time of delivery, got maybe 60, you did lock in, as he, I believe, so adeptly showed you, a guaranteed net dollar return over cost of production. Now, our purpose in here isn't to dictate to you what amount of profit you make. That's up to you. You've told us as your employees that you expect us to bargain for you at cost of production plus a reasonable profit. Now I know that reasonable has a lot of different meaning to a lot of different people. Inside one, turn now to side number two.